that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, ce que nous avons vu de nos yeux, which we have looked upon, es lo que hemos mirado, and our hands have touched. The word of life. Hello and welcome to the amazing collection, The Bible for Women, book by book. And today we are in the book of Galatians. This was the year of the 20th anniversary of Alex Haley's Story Roots. It came out on CD and DVD and VHS and everything. And I realized that my children, who are 12 and 16, had never seen it. So I thought a good thing for the next movie night would be to rent the series and sit down and let them see this. We could talk about it. Well, we were about halfway through, and my son said, you got to turn this off. I can't take another minute of it. And I looked over at my daughter, and she was crying, and she said, why would anyone do this? 
there's this beautiful man, this warrior, this Kunta Kinte, who has been captured and taken from his home and mistreated and abused and sold. A man who knew what it was to be free, now imprisoned. And we said, what gave people the idea that they had the right to enslave somebody else? They were outraged. I never did talk them into watching the rest of the movie, but we did talk about bondage and freedom. I think the outrage that my kids had is the same outrage that Paul has in the book of Galatians. He hears that the people that he had helped free with the gospel of grace are now back in chains. They have been bound by Judaizers to the law, to tradition, to rituals, and it's breaking Paul's heart. This book of Galatians is referred to as the Emancipation Proclamation of the New Testament. Paul is often referred to as the Moses of the Christian church because his whole mission was to take people out of the bondage of sin, yes, but also out of the bondage of law and works and set them free. And now he is hearing that his beloved Galatians are back in bondage. But this time, instead of sin, it's to works. I want you to refer quickly to the map so that you can see the area that we're talking about. The Galatians had settled in Asia Minor. Now, we know that this, these are the churches because Paul names them specifically. But what we don't know for sure is when he founded these churches. It's believed that it was on his first missionary trip and that he's writing this from Antioch in about... 49 AD. We're going to assume that that is the case because no one knows for sure. But what we do know is he was brokenhearted. Tradition says that he gathered some of the faithful brethren together and wept and prayed all night long. And in the morning, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he sat down with pen and papyrus and wrote this grand book. We know he wrote it because at the end he says, do you see how big I'm writing you? It's just passionate and it's vibrant. It's almost like he has underlined, put everything in uppercase, exclamation points all over, because what he's saying is, if grace has set you free, why go back to the chains? You have freedom in Christ. So if you haven't already, open your Bibles to Galatians and get out your little outlines, because we are going to jump right in to division number one where Paul defended the gospel of grace. And that's all chapters 1 and 2. Paul defended the gospel of grace. Point A, Paul greeted the Galatians with the gospel of grace and peace. And then he cursed those who preached a distorted gospel. Now, the reason we're saying he greeted the Galatians is because he typically starts with a salutation. This one's a little bit different, though. This time, he is jumping directly into the problem. He usually asks for prayer requests, says how much he misses them, wants to thank them for their prayers. He doesn't do that this time. And he names these churches specifically. He wants this letter to go to all of those in the area of Galatia because this is his target audience. Then he does something that he usually does in all of his books, and that is he unites the words grace and peace. He puts them together. Now, we talked about that briefly before. The word peace is the Jewish word shalom. And the word grace is the Greek word. And just by putting the two together, grace and peace, he's uniting Gentile and Jew. But he doesn't take a whole lot of time on peace because the main focus he wants them to get out of this is grace. He says, you know this word. You're familiar with this word. This is your word. It means undeserved gift, unearned prize. And these people had received it with joy and gratitude. They knew they hadn't earned the gift of salvation, but they had received it. And he is saying, what has happened? But he knows what happened. And that is that the Judaizers, these fellows who have followed him from church to church, every time he planted a place, they came in behind him with law. 
Now, they may have been well-meaning, and they were Jewish Christians. They were Hellenistic Jews. They were not from the Holy Land. They were from the Ro Roman province, but they were Jewish Christians. And they would come in behind Paul and say, okay, well, this is all well and, and good, but in order to be a real Christian, you got to be a real Jew. So what we need to do is fix you up. First thing we need to do is circumcision. Paul's saying, no, you don't. But these guys are saying, yeah, you do. If you want to be a real Christian, then first you've got to be a real Jew. And by insisting that they have circumcision, they were snipping away at their faith, so to speak. Because as you remember, circumcision was a tradition that a Hebrew boy at day eight would have the foreskin removed to symbolize the covenant that was originally between Abraham and God. And they were saying to these fellows, you need to do that. Paul is making this way too easy for you. It's faith plus circumcision equals salvation. It's faith plus laws equals salvation. Paul's saying, no, it's not. And furthermore, there is nothing easy about grace. There was nothing easy about leaving heaven. There was nothing easy about being born as a man. There was nothing easy about walking a perfectly sinless life. There was nothing easy about being on trial, abandoned, beaten. There was nothing easy about crucifixion or death. There's nothing easy about the resurrection. This grace did cost. It was earned, but it was done by Jesus. And it does not need to be done by you or anybody else. Well, besides attacking grace, these Judaizers attacked Paul. In point B, Paul had to give his biographical history to defend his apostleship to the Galatians. Now, the reason they had to do that is the Judaizers came in and said, hey, listen, he wasn't one of the 12. I mean, if you do your history, you'll see. He, did, he wasn't there with Jesus. He doesn't have the authority. And who is this Paul anyway? I mean... Does he have letters from Jerusalem like we have letters from Jerusalem? Has he really been approved? Now, this is so sad to me because they have impugned his character. They've undermined his authority. And these confused Galatians are believing the Judaizers. So they ask him, apparently in a letter, what are your credentials? So he has to go back and say, oh, all right, you want to hear about some credentials? I happen to know more about the law than these guys that are teaching you the law. I was a true Jew. I followed the law my whole life. I was a Pharisee. You name a law, I know it. I was so zealous for the word of God, for the Torah and for the Talmud, that I persecuted Christians because I didn't think what they were doing was right until I met Jesus. And in verse 12, in chapter 1, he says, it was a revelation. He said, for I neither received my new commission from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He's saying, credentials? I know the law better than they do. I was raised in it. I was commissioned by the risen Lord. I have the same authority. And he is saying this in humility. He is not bragging. He's doing it to put their minds, their troubled minds at ease. And then he says, then I went off to Damascus for three years to study. It was just me and God. The Holy Spirit revealed Jesus Christ in every page of the Bible to me. And there I was a student. And he explains there he had authority. Point C, he moves to another example. Paul reminded the Galatians of the authority of the gospel of grace and that it was approved by the council in Jerusalem. And that's all in chapter 2. He says, after my three years of study, just me and God, I went up to Jerusalem for 15 days, and there I met with who you're calling the head of the church, Peter, and James, the very brother of my Lord. And you know what they did? They blessed me. They blessed my mission. And all of Samaria, Judea, and Jerusalem celebrated because of me, because God was using me. I was blessed. I was commissioned. Then he goes on to another example. And he says, 14 years after that, I was forced to go to Jerusalem again. The council was meeting. And with me, I brought Barnabas, who you know and love, and I brought Titus, Titus the Greek. 
the Greek Christian. And I brought him as a living illustration that circumcision is not necessary for faith. So everything these Judaizers are telling you, the council already voted was not necessary. There, they examined Titus and his faith and said, it is true. You do not need to be circumcised to become a Christian. You do not need to become a Jew to become a Christian. It's faith plus nothing equals salvation. They blessed the message. It was approved by the council. His third example is point D on your outline. Paul referred to actually having to correct Peter on the matter of freedom in Christ. Now, the reason he did this is not being slanderous. He's probably not even telling them something they hadn't heard of before. But what he's saying is, you consider Peter the head of the church. These Judaizers consider Peter the head of the church. Well, I had to go to him and correct his thinking. You see, Peter was spending all of his time with the Jewish believers and sliding the Gentile believers. And it was dividing the church. It was hurting the church. It was even leading Barnabas astray. So he went to Antioch and he met with them and they prayed together and Peter apologized, repented, and changed. Now, that's authority. Those are credentials. There, there is a saying that Judaism was the cradle for Christianity. Well, it was almost the death of her as well. And that is something Paul knew. Look with me in chapter 2 on verse 21. Chapter 2, verse 21. Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. It is faith plus nothing equals salvation. In division number two, Paul is going to switch tempo a little bit because he defines the gospel of grace. Division number two, Paul defined the gospel of grace. Again, his theme is, if grace has set you free, why go back to the chains? Look at point A. The Galatians were given the Holy Spirit by faith, not by works. And he begins this commission in chapter three by saying, you fools, who has bewitched you? Who has changed your thinking? Remember, ladies, when the Holy Spirit came upon people in those days, there were signs and miracles and wonders, big, glorious things that couldn't be explained and could not be denied. And Paul is saying to these folks, you know this, you tried works and it didn't do anything for you. You, you volunteered and it didn't make you holy. You donated money, it didn't make you pure. It didn't change who you were, but you know for yourself that when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon you, you were different. So why go back? Why go back to the bars, to the chains, when it didn't bring permanent change? I heard it once spoken this way, that it's almost like Paul was likening the law to a cage with bars, and that laws and works were there for a reason, to restrain. If there was a wild beast within, that kept things in place, gave an order, gave a boundary. But what he's saying is, it didn't change the person. It did not change the person. Now, if the Holy Spirit comes upon that tiger and teaches and trains and guides and transforms, you can throw the cage open and roam wild. The bars are no longer necessary if the creature has been changed. And he's reminding them that didn't happen with works. That only happened through faith. In part B, the Galatians, he reminds them, were justified by faith, not works, like Abraham. Now he's gonna use a specific Jewish example because he's really kind of scolding the Judaizers and, and some of the people that have bought into this whole idea, well, if I have to become Jewish, well, I'm gonna do everything Abraham did. He's saying, <laughs> Abraham is called the father of the faith. He's not the father of works. He's not the father of the law. They didn't even have the law. 
the law didn't come until Moses was there. He's saying he was justified just as if I'd never sinned because of his faith. Nowhere in the scripture do you see God commending people for just keeping the law and only doing good works. He doesn't. He doesn't say, yep, that Eugene, nobody keeps commandment number five like Eugene. No. He befriends, he commissions, he exalts men of faith. And they are not perfect men. They all erred. It was their faith that saved them, not perfectly working out law. Now, I would imagine if I was a Galatian and I had been exposed to these two different schools of thought, I'd be thinking, okay, wait a minute. So you're saying it doesn't have to be faith plus circumcision. No, Paul says it doesn't. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So it, it doesn't have to be faith plus Mosaic law equals salvation. No. So, so it doesn't have to be faith plus Sunday school? No. The only thing you have to do is the amazing collection. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Trying to save you your weight. No. <laughs> faith plus nothing equals salvation. He wants them to know. And if you're true sons of Abraham, then it's faith. It is not works. Now, in the next part, part C, he reminds them, the law was given to draw men to faith, not to save them, but to draw them to faith. The law was really there to relate to sin, not to holiness. The law was there to prove the need. So he's saying the law isn't saying you just got, you got to be good enough to get to heaven. The law is there to say you are guilty. You will never be good enough. So there... In that, we realize that's how grace perfects her work. The law is there to reveal sin and bring about repentance. And then grace does her perfect work. Point D, the Galatians were adopted sons of God and no longer slaves to the law. Now, this is actually a Greek example. We are used to the term adoption, but it originated here. It is a Greek term. And in the Greek custom, when a boy was born to their Roman family, he was put under the authority of a, of a trusted slave or trustee. So in other words, the son was really obedient to the slave who was obedient to the father. And until what Paul calls the fullness of time or until his adult age, his job really was to be a slave to the slave. He never had direct contact with his father. He did not have rights of a full son until he came of age. And then when he did, if this child were obedient to the trustee, to the slave, and therefore to the father, he was embraced. He was given the full rights of sonship. He had direct contact with his dad. He was a full heir. And Paul is saying, you have been adopted. You have full rights. You're a child of God now because of the perfect work that Jesus did. He was perfectly obedient to the Father. He did this perfectly for us and now we have direct access. We can say, Abba Daddy, we are heirs. But it's because of what He did and how He obeyed not what we do or how we obey. Point E, Paul reminds the Galatians they needed to regain their freedom and blessing by faith, not law. They needed to regain their freedom and blessing by faith, not law. There's a neat little personal story in here. And he says, remember when I came to you, we were so close. We had the blessing of fellowship. We had the blessing of love. We had a bond. We had an understanding. And even though they were a poor little church, these people wanted to do everything to serve Paul. He was so sick that he said, remember you even offered to put your eyes out for me if it would help. You were willing to do anything for me. We had this neat bond. It's one of the blessings, the joys, and the love of the freedom of Christ. Well, you've lost that. You've lost that. You've gone back to this restrained, restricted, unhappy, unproductive faith. 
throw open the cage, you tigers, and be free to have that again, where we can fellowship again and be friends. I am not your enemy. And he reminds them the only way to do that is to regain their freedom. Point F, the sons of Abraham represent the slave ship of the law versus the freedom of the promise. And again, this is a Jewish example. It goes all the way back to Genesis because he's referring to Abraham, whose legal wife, the wife of the promise was Sarah. And God had promised the two of them, if you follow me, three things will happen. I'm gonna give you land, I'm going to give you descendants more than the stars, and I will bless the entire world through you. And we know that that happened through Christ Jesus. But somewhere along the line, Abraham and Sarah got a little restless waiting for this promise to be fulfilled, and Sarah decides that she's going to let her slave, Hagar, lay with Abraham. And they're just going to fix this situation, and he'll have an heir. Well, he does. He has a son, Ishmael but he was not the son of the promise. He was the son of a slave. And then some 13 years later, God in his perfect timing fulfilled this promise. And ladies, let me tell you, the baby with Hagar may have been natural, but this baby with Sarah and Abraham was supernatural. She was 89 and he was 99. <laughs> this is some big God work right here. And what Paul is saying is you who believe who believe the promise. You are the true sons. You are the true seeds of Abraham. It's supernatural. It's looking to the future. He even draws a parallel between the sons of the promise or the sons of Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the sons of the slave of Hagar and Ishmael. It's bondage. It's Mount Sinai. It's law. And I wish I could see the expression on the faces of the Judaizers that are reading this, because he basically says, hey, you Gentiles, you ones that believe, you are the real seeds of Abraham. You unbelieving Jews, you're not. He drew the line in the sand. In division number three, Paul is going to show them how to apply this grace. Paul applied for them the gospel of grace. In other words, he's saying, listen, your life is supposed to be abundant. It's supposed to be full and it is supposed to be free. No more chains. God wants you to live a great big life right now, not restrained. And in point A, Paul sought to help the Galatians reclaim that, that position of theirs and the practice of liberty. And this is our memory verse. Look with me, if you will, in chapter 5. Verse 1, he says, It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. He's saying you're not chained to the law anymore. You are not bound by good works. You are free. I want you to hear this story from Pharaoh. Because she, like Kunta Kinte, doesn't want to ever go back to the bonds of slavery. She knew what it was like to be imprisoned in a foreign land, to be held captive, basically, to be bound to depression and isolation, to be in the chains of a false religion. And Christ set her free. And she will never go back to those bonds of slavery again. My family were orthodox. From early childhood, the teaching of Islam became a part of my life. I was taught Muhammad is the final prophet and Allah is the only God. My husband and I left Iran in 1974. In our wildest dream, we never thought to this day we still be far away from our home country in the United States. Our purpose was just education, 46 years. 79, Iran and Iraq war began. 79, American um, government froze Iranian asset. And 79, our first child was born, Amir. And uh, 1979, also, we lost our reputation as Iranian students. 
We lost our support from the government because of the change of the government. No longer we received that support. After changing jobs from one job to another job, I started working at Holiday Inn in a laundry room. That was a secure place for me because immigration was after Iranian students. Gradually, we lost our visa and we became illegal on the top of everything else. I pursued Islam wholeheartedly. I prayed more than five times a day. When our son was two years old, for the purpose of safety and security, as I said, because of the publicity and the promotion against us, people hated us. We were known as terrorists. For his safety, we placed him in a church daycare. From holiday in, I was hired to take care of a lady who had Alzheimer's. She was in full depression, I was in full depression. She was on tranquilizer, I was in tranquilizer. Except I would give her one and I would take two myself in order to be able to function. Amir would come home, Amir, honey, what did you learn today? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. In the same church, they also offer an aerobic class for ladies. Aerobic class began with praise and worship and ended with devotion and a time of prayer time. And I would skip the last two parts. It did not apply to me. And they were telling me that I was a sinner, that Jesus died for my sin, that I needed to be washed with his blood. These were foreign language to me. But these ladies pursue me. They never gave up. As hard as, as I fought with them and argued with them, and I was just trying to teach the ways of Islam to them, they just continued with a smile every time receiving me. They invited me to church Wednesday night dinner and Sunday service. What would be the future of my children. How am I going to make it in a foreign country? I was homesick. I was depressed. I was on a heavy dose of tranquilizer and volume. The only hope that I had to go to aerobic class the following day. I went so early that the church was still closed. I sat in the parking lot and waited for ladies to show up. As they came and they opened up the fellowship hall and they put the music on, it was always Christian music. The first song was, Our God is an awesome God who reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God who reigns. Many times I had heard that song, but I would close my ears that these words, they were far and they would not sink into my heart. But that day, it was my day. My ears were open and those words sank deep into my heart and it began a revolution in my heart. Where is my God? If there is a time, if there is an hour that I need God, it is now. Where is my God? And they say, well, Farah, would you like us to pray for you? I said, it won't hurt. Maybe your God will answer. They held hands and they called their God, Heavenly Father. That was again a foreign language to me. I was so lonely. I was so empty. I was so desperate for my father. And when they called their God, Heavenly Father, presence of God was so real, I could not deny no longer. Electricity was going through my hands, his presence so real in our midst. And they shared all the problems, all the prayer requests as with a friend, talking with a friend. And they shared my problem also with their God. As I was crying, going to my car, I began talking to their Jesus. I said, who are you? If you are God, I want to know. And whether you can do anything about my situation. I went to bed and I had a dream. In the dream, I was preparing for a journey. I became light like feather standing in front of him. He's dressed in white and I look at myself and I compare myself with him. I couldn't understand why I was full of dust and ashes. What happened to my nice clothes? I'm comparing myself and I see myself filthy and dirty. He's radiating, he's full of light and he's holy and he's beautiful and wonderful. I woke up, it was in the morning. Sun had seven times more radiant. Green was green and blue was blue with everything the night before it was gray to me. And I was still singing, praise the Lord, praise his name. I went to the bathroom to take my tranquilizer customary. I heard the voice of God in my heart. You have Jesus now. 
do you still need these tranquilizers? And I said, no, and that was 19 years ago. My situation and circumstances for so many years did not change, but my heart changed. As I began reading the Bible, as I learned about this Jesus, as I learned about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, as I learned about what it means, righteousness, what it means being saved, what it means that my name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, what it means that there is only one God and one me between God and man and that is the man Christ Jesus who died for my sin as I understood the book of Isaiah about my filthy rags my confession became like Peter's confession Jesus you are indeed the son of the living God I love you and I thank you for saving me point B Paul explained that the principles of law and liberty are opposites. He lays it out very clearly. One is a gift, one is nose to the grindstone. One is man's effort, one is God's provision. One is temporal, one is eternal. Why would you want the chains when you can have all of God's glory? He basically says it this way. When you are bound to law, you lose your joy, you lose your passion, you lose your purpose, you lose your imagination, your power. You become rigid and prideful and dry and useless. So don't go back to the chains. Point C. Paul told the Galatians that the power of liberty is found in the Holy Spirit. And we frequently refer to this whole passage. Look with me, if you will. Chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. This is where we find the fruit of the Spirit. Well, what he's saying is, you didn't have those characteristics before your faith, now did you? These came with the power of the Holy Spirit. These prove who you are. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these, there is no law. Against those, there is no law. But he's saying, be careful in your freedom. This does not give you a license for fleshy, disobedient behavior. No, don't abuse your liberty. But live in this, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the evidence that you are the uncaged tiger. Point D, Paul reminded the Galatians that they were liberated to do good. They were liberated. They were freed from bondage. They were free from sin, and now they are free from law to do good. Now, again, I, I think of those little Galatians thinking something like, no, no, wait a minute. You just said it was faith plus nothing. And he's saying that's true. It is faith plus nothing equals salvation. But listen to me. If you are infused by this Holy Spirit I just told you about, you should be full of characteristics like Christ. You should be full of gratitude. You should be full of love and you want to serve out of that. It will just happen naturally. You will want to obey because you're empowered by the Holy Spirit and because your heart is so relieved that you're finally free. I'm not saying it's a have to. I'm saying it should be a, a want to. And in it, you can just see pictures of Christ, the ultimate uncaged tiger, because he showed love to the unlovely. He was full of joy in every circumstance, peace beyond understanding, kind, good. And was he so faithful? He was gentle and self-controlled. He's saying that when you are free, you are free to behave as Christ to do good. And he will get the glory. He does a very short closing where he, being Paul, compares himself to the Judaizers. And he said, final note, I don't mind being considered a slave because I'm a slave to Christ. I'm branded, I'm marked for Christ. And I'm not afraid of persecution. The reason they're telling you to be a Jew is because they're afraid of persecution. I spent the 26, first 26 years of my life in the chains of sin. I was enslaved to the world system. And then I found freedom in Christ. And let me tell you, there's nothing like it. And change only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But somehow in the first couple years of, of my new life, I found myself under the authority of some well-meaning Judaizers. And boy, did these ladies lay some law on me. I got calls during the day, have you done your quiet time? Well, then you better hang up and go be with God. How much have you studied? Are you working in the Sunday school yet? You mean you're not homeschooling? It was law and it was judgment. And before you knew it, there was no joy. I was enslaved to religion and had lost that first passion was my relationship with Jesus Christ. I was ineffective for the kingdom because I was so bound up by works. Now, I'd love to tell you that that never happens, but sometimes it does. Sometimes I just get in that mindset and I'm just checking things off a list and God in his mercy lays me flat on my back and reminds me, Margie, you're like those Galatians. You fool, who has bewitched you? You can't earn this, it is a gift. And yet when I read this, sometimes I wonder how many of us still think we gotta work it all out. And how many of us lay that on our sisters in Christ? I think what Paul's saying is wise up and remember the truth that you are free and no longer bound by sin and no longer bound by law and works. So take a minute, enjoy this music video and celebrate that freedom. <laughs> 